Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Saturday, Towergate day 324, January the 27th, 2018. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, especially thank you uh, to all those uh, who leave comments in the comments section, uh, those wonderful comments of praise for yours truly. I do appreciate it and I read each and every one of them. Thanks so much. Major, major breaking news today. For those of you who've been walk, watching my Towergate videos now for some time, you, you probably know that uh, for the past at least three or four months, I've been saying that I no longer believe that Christopher Steele was the author of the dossier. And I've had several reasons for that. And it's because back in the uh, August, uh, sort of late July, August of um, 2017, uh, I began looking at these <clears throat> released documents from the... Um, legal briefs from the deposition, Christopher Steele's deposition in the case in the UK of Mr. Gubarev versus Christopher Steele. And as I've told you many times, in those depositions, Christopher Steele said that he never met with the Russian sources directly. He used intermediaries. And so for the longest time I've been saying people keep talking about Christopher Steele being the primary author despite the fact that he never met with the sources directly that he used intermediaries so I've been saying for the longest time we need to find out who the intermediaries are now I have suspected that possibly now that since we learned about Nellie Orr and her little radio system that um, very likely that she was one of his sources and it could have also been that the FBI may have been putting people in there maybe the CIA who, who knows it could be uh, anyone but now we have confirmed I would say proof confirmed proof of an individual who is probably the person who was Christopher Steele's primary intermediary we now know we're about 99 percent sure this will come out in the next couple of, if not days, then weeks, and we'll confirm that this individual was Christopher Steele's primary, if not his only, intermediary. The guy who was getting the information from the sources, which we have been told up to this time were Russians, and then he was passing this on to Christopher Steele. We also know that Christopher Steele said in his depositions, that he did not go out and seek this information, that it came to him. He says it was, quote, not sought, only received, unquote. So this tells us an awful lot, and this is where I've been focusing. No one else seems to be focusing on this point. You continue to turn on whichever broadcast you watch or internet site you watch or listen to and everyone continues to push this narrative that Christopher Steele was the author and I am saying as I have been saying for months now that I believe I'll be proven correct that Christopher Steele was not the author of the dossier he may have had a little editing here he may have thrown a few things here and there but for the most part Christopher Steele wasn't really the source and we also know from Glenn Simpson's testimony that he states when he was asked in the hearings about Christopher Steele getting this information from these Russians, Glenn Simpson, Glenn going to the slammer Simpson, I should call him, because he is going to the slammer <clears throat> for the lies he's told. Um, Glenn Simpson said that, you know, well, Christopher Steele hadn't been to the Soviet Union or Russia in 17 years. And the sources that he had back when he was there are probably no longer around. He was there right after the collapse of the Soviet Union and Yeltsin took over and it was right about that time that Christopher Steele became the station chief there in Moscow. And, uh, you know, the people who were in place during Yeltsin were still most, a lot of the um, uh, old hardliners from the Soviet Union mixed in with some of the new reformers and uh, the KGB essentially still existed. So and the KGB is gone. Now you have the FSB. But um, chances are, going back 17 years, <clears throat> the sources that Christopher Steele may have had were probably no longer high-level sources, certainly no one that was around 
Yeltsin or in the post-collapse period of the Soviet Union is probably still on the inside of the high level of uh, Russian intelligence at the FSB. So <clears throat> this is what <clears throat> another reason why I never really believed uh, that Christopher Steele was getting this information directly from these Russian intel sources. And as I've said many other times, if this was really true Russian intelligence that was that found its way into the dossier, it never would have found its way into the dossier. That would have been one of the, if not probably the biggest intelligence secret that the Russians ever would have had on the U.S. government. They would have kept the secret like that very tightly under wraps. It never would have got out. It certainly wouldn't get out to a bunch of lackeys <clears throat> like Mr. Melian <clears throat> and some of these other guys. And it just never would have made it uh, out of the inner circle of Putin's intelligence people. It just never would have. And no one would have penetrated that. Certainly not these guys. So this is all the reasons why I've never really believed that Christopher Steele was going to these Russians who had access to this high-level intelligence. They got this extremely vital, important intelligence, and then they put it into a dossier and passed it around to the media and to the FBI. I mean, it's just none of this makes any sense. None of it adds up. And so as I thought through these things, I realized, you know, this is a lot of BS and that there's something else going on here. And then, of course, as we learned more and more about Fusion GPS, and then we learned about uh, Ben and Nellie Orr, or Bruce and Nellie Orr, uh, then I, it began, the picture become, became much clearer to me that this uh, dossier was essentially put together by Fusion GPS. And so now that we are about 99% sure that we know the name of the intermediary and we find out who he was working for, it proves exactly what I believe to be true. At this point, it appears even more true. So... The individual who we can now be pretty confident was the intermediary, was the person feeding Christopher Steele, was a man named Edward Baumgartner. Edward Baumgartner. Mr. Baumgartner is a British national who speaks fluent Russian and he runs a PR shop out of London. He spent most of 2016 tweeting anti-Trump propaganda. Baumgartner was working for Confusion GPS. Baumgartner was working for Confusion GPS and Glenn going to the slammer Simpson. At the very same time that Baumgartner was working for Confusion GPS on the Prevazon case with lawyer, Russian lawyer, Vessel Naskaya, Baumgartner was also working with Simpson on a smear campaign against an anti-Putin whistleblower who we of course know as Mr. Browder. And of course he gave his testimony to Congress and we covered that here on Towergate uh, back when that um, hearing took place. So here we have Mr. Baumgartner. He runs a little PR shop down in London uh, in cl fairly close proximity to Orbis, probably knows Steele very well because they probably trade information. So we have Mr. Baumgartner <clears throat> working for Fusion GPS on two things, on two matters. One, he's working at putting together a smear campaign with Vessel Naskaya against Mr. Browder, but he's also working for Fusion GPS on the Trump-Russia uh, thing in the dossier. So like I said, I suggested it was probably Glenn Simpson, his wife, Mary Jacoby, with Nellie Orr, getting some intel and access through Bruce Orr, her husband, putting together the dossier, sending it to Christopher Steele, who would then put a stamp of approval on it, would send it back to Fusion GPS, and also, he would, be, he would be the guy who could get it to British intelligence, French intelligence, German intelligence, any intelligence he wanted, is, is, and especially the FBI, the CIA, and probably any other intel agency that he uh, wanted because he probably had access and has contacts with all these people. So, here we can see Mr. Baumgartner working for Fusion GPS, and he's the intermediary. So, Fusion... Is we've got Confusion GPS with uh, 
Glenn going to the Slammer Simpson, working with his wife, Mary Jacoby, using intel that they got uh, from November 2015 to April 2016 before Mike Rogers shut them down, getting this intel and creating a narrative, a story around it. Then they would obviously send this to their other employee, Mr. Baumgartner in the UK, who being a PR guy in the UK, probably having some connections, speaking fluent Russian, probably digs up some uh, dirt and some propaganda, some National Enquirer type scandal stuff. He puts that together and then he sends it back to Fusion GPS. Then they combine that with uh, bits and pieces, uh, fragments of intel they got through their illegal surveillance that they were granted access to by the FBI, and they begin to put together the narrative story, which finds its way back to Christopher Steele, who then puts a stamp of approval on it, sends it back to Fusion GPS, and then disperses it throughout the intel community, globally. There you go. That is exactly what it looks like. So it looks like Mr. Baumgartner is our intermediary, and the intermediary was working for Confusion GPS. Just like I said, it was nothing more than a loop. Nothing more than a loop. My guess is that Mr. Baumgartner, now that his name has been outed, is going to be receiving a letter from a couple of these committees in Congress that are doing these subpoenas. They're going to want to talk to him for sure. I absolutely guarantee you they're going to want to talk to Mr. Baumgartner. And now Mr. Baumgartner is also going to be getting subpoenaed from Mr. Gubarev, probably from Carter Page's lawyers, probably from the three Russian oligarchs from Alpha Bank, probably from everyone else that's suing Fusion GPS, Christopher Steele, and BuzzFeed. Because now he has become a central player because now we know that he was probably the person feeding Christopher Steele. And he was working for Confusion GPS. This is a major bombshell. Now, it'll take the media uh, and most of uh, other people that you probably watch on YouTube and various other things, it will take them a couple weeks to catch up to us. That's okay. That's okay. They'll get there. It's not a competition for me. <clears throat> I'm not in the clickbait business. I don't run ads on my YouTube videos, as you probably well know and hopefully appreciate. No pop-up ads during my videos. I don't have a Patreon account. You can't donate any money to me, even if you wanted to. I'm not accepting any money. I'm not interested in the money. I've got a job. I'm interested in the truth. And I don't want to be compromised by taking people's money. Someone suggested there'll be advertisers contacting me to want me to, you know, have sponsors and, and to actually get an office and professional video equipment and do like a professional show. That's not really something I'm looking into at all or even have any interest in really. Not that maybe some years down the road it may happen just because it happens, but it's not the reason I do these videos. I started doing these videos, as most of you know, as a personal diary because I found it would be a little easier than sitting down with a spiral notebook and writing, you know, for hours every night. I figured it was faster just to talk through it in a video. And then at the end of this whole scandal, when it's all done, I can go back through my library of videos and I can uh, pull the information out of there. And then I can put together an actual writing, an actual text document, which can be the foundation for a book or a movie or anything else. It's documenting the day by day unraveling of the deep state coup, which is nothing more than a simple, it's a kind of a fancy term for a frame up. This was nothing more than a frame up operation, which the FBI is very good at. They frame lots and lots of people, including innocent people, by the way. <clears throat> so that is the major bombshell blockbuster of the day, but there's a couple other things that we need to get to just for shits and giggles, because after all, it is the weekend. So there you go, from Fusion GPS to Mr. Baumgartner to Mr. Steele and back to Fusion GPS. That's how it went down. And in a couple weeks when everyone catches up, that's what they're going to be talking about. Next up, the Rotten Reverends 
political advisor, one of her political advisors, and this individual happens to be her faith advisor. He was her faith advisor on her 2008 and 2016 campaigns. His name is Burns Strider. The New York Times ran a story on Friday saying that Strider repeatedly sexually harassed a 30-year-old female campaign staffer on the 2008 campaign. And um, the rotten Reverend Clinton refused to fire him, <clears throat> despite the fact that Patty Doyle, the rotten Reverend Clinton's campaign chief, requested that Strider be fired. But the rotten Reverend refused, and she stuck with her boy, Mr. Strider. Now, Mr. Strider uh, is a co-founder of a group called American Values Network. I wonder what kind of values he's talking about. Now, Mr. Strider works for David Brock. <laughs> yes, that's right. He works with... Man, if you work with David Brock, you, there's no way you can be a religious man. <laughs> the two just don't wash, my friends. <laughs> that's like oil and water. It just doesn't work. Now, it appears that the 30-year-old <clears throat> woman who was working as a campaign staffer for the Rotten Reverend Clinton in 2008 was moved, essentially fired, out of the campaign. And Mr. Strider apparently was docked two weeks' pay and was supposed to go to some classes so that he would learn how to behave, I guess. If you're a faith guy, a like a minister, a faith advisor, and you're sexually harassing campaign staffers, you don't sound like a very religious man to me or anyone who should be giving anyone any advice. But that's how it is with the rotten Reverend Clinton. All her friends, have you noticed, are like this. Her husband is a crooked peri uh, peckered serial rapist. She is the one who introduced Anthony Weiner to Huma Abedin. It was the rotten Reverend Clinton that put Huma and Weiner together. Of course, we know her good friend Harvey Weinstein, what he's all about. Of course, we can only assume in the sickest of our imaginations what Mr. Podesta is all about. No question, you could just look at that guy and tell that he's some kind of a freak. God, I don't even want to know what Podesta's into. We just know that he's a close friend and associate of the Rotten Reverend, and it seems like every male that's around the Rotten Reverend Clinton is some kind of pervert. That's what the facts tell us. And let's not forget the, the video that I did back in August, I think, August or September, where we talked about the Rotten Reverend Clinton's other minister, Mr. Reverend Bill Shalady. Well, Mr. Shalady wrote a book of daily devotions. And every day during the campaign, he would send Hillary a daily devotion, which she would read and pray about because she's the reverend and her reverend was sending her daily devotions. So he writes a book of these daily devotions and then the book had to be pulled from bookstore shelves because Mr. Reverend Shalady was found to have plagiarized the writings in the book. So I guess that would make Mr. Strider and Reverend Shalady the Rotten Reverends, Rotten Reverends. Is that about right? The Rotten Reverend has her own Rotten Reverends. Two of them. The Rotten Reverends, Rotten Reverends. How much fun is that on a Saturday? I bet you're laughing now. The Rotten Reverends, Rotten Reverends. Very well done. Alrighty. <clears throat> Here's just a statement of fact for you to chew on. The Department of Injustice and the Federal Bureau of I'm With Her need complete house cleaning. There's no need to wait for indictments to come down. The evidence is already enough to act.
the FBI I'm with her director Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray must act now if he wants to save his reputation and that of the FBI what's left of it he must now gain control he must now start cooperating and and participate in exposing the crimes that went on it is the only way that he can save his reputation or that of the FBI Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray it's time to come clean time to clean it up or you will not survive what's coming Paul Speary of the New York Post this past week wrote two explosive bombshell articles Friday Mr. Speary tweeted out the following the DOJ and the FBI are going to be in a world of hurt after the memo is released yes that's our understanding that that's what's going to be the case and of course we can see already that uh, the liberal legacy media and the Democratic shills like Adam Schiff are already out there falling and playing right into the trap that Nunes has set for them they're out there saying yeah well this is just a memo written by these Republicans it's it's a biased partisan thing and it's uh, just to go after Democrats and the FBI and they don't really you know talk about their sources it's just a it's just a memo it's just a, a kind of a narrative they don't actually you know show us the facts or anything like that exactly that was exactly the point Nunes knew that's exactly what you were going to say which is why he's already putting together the facts from the FISA court 99 page fight court FISA court document which has already been released publicly there's a lot of redactions but I'm thinking he's going to get the unredacted version of that and that's what he's going to release to support the memo so that we are going to get to see the facts that support the narrative in the four-page memo thanks to Peter Schiff and the Democrats calling for it they will now not be able to say when when Nunes gets ready to release that it'll make it impossible for uh, for Schiff and the Democrats to say wait you can't release that that's all classified information <clears throat> because they will have already gone out and spent a couple of weeks talking about how Nunes uh, and the Republicans uh, wouldn't would, would not release the actual uh, evidence of where they got the information for the memo well now they're gonna be caught because they'll have put that out there Nunes knew that and that's why he's preparing it right now because now once he actually releases what they say he wouldn't release they'll be stuck you can't have it both ways they just walked into a trap more revelations from Peter's been stroking us and loose Lisa page text conversations about getting a story into the Wall Street Journal here's exact quote from those text the loose Lisa page texting to Peter been stroking us says quote article is out but hidden behind paywall so can't read it responding to that Ben Strokinus says Wall Street Journal question mark boy that was fast should I find it and tell the team unquote who's the team the secret society the anarchy party do you think that the team was in the insurance business now the reporter in question appears to be Devlin Barrett who currently works for the Washington Post now keep in mind this text was sent out on October the 28th the day that the reopening of the Clinton investigation was announced that was the day that they found the laptop computer of Anthony's Weiner and uh, it previously belonged to Huma it had the classified emails along with the dick pics and other things and that's what uh, caused that and led to this conversation there's also a pattern of news stories that correspond with other texts that are still being deciphered so they're putting more and more of this stuff together as they look through all these texts putting it into context along with and putting that beside events that happened and news stories that broke or went out to show where 
it was the FBI, and we can see here that uh, Peter Van Strokenis and Luce Lisa Page were feeding at least the Wall Street Journal, probably other news organizations. We're also going to find out who Fusion GPS was paying. So look out, my friends. She's going to blow. There's also text that now for the first time revealed the name Bruce Priestep, the head of counterintelligence, Peter's been stroking his, his boss, because they refer to Bill, which is, uh, we believe, is Priestep, and it shows that he was now fully involved, and uh, so he's no longer behind the curtain. We're also learning that the memo will likely be released within the week. It will go to Trump sometime this week, and he'll have five days to either stop it or allow it to be released. We have Sarah Carter telling Fox News that the memo contains coup plans by the Democrats. In other words, a frame-up. What was the most memorable phrase from the Watergate fiasco? It was, what did the president know and when did he know it? That came from Howard Baker. So now is it time to ask the question of long Mac Daddy Barack Hussein Obama. When, what did you know, Mr. President, and when did you know it? Keep in, my, keep in mind, friends, this thing goes all the way to the top. All the way to the top. We also have Chairman Grassley of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate sending out a letter to Democrats this week asking lots of questions. They have two weeks to respond to the letter in letter form, or they will be called in, subpoenaed, and called in to testify in person. These letters have gone to the DNC uh, campaign, the Hillary for America campaign, that would be Robbie Mook, uh, the uh, Debbie Blabbermouth Wasserman Schultz, Donna Brazil, John Podesta, and Benenson. They want they have questions about the dossier, Steele, and not well, whether or not they had knowledge that Steele or GPS was working with the FBI or any other government organizations. There you go. The noose is closing in and it's working its way up the chain pretty soon. The perps are going to get their comeuppance. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's Saturday Towergate video. I'll be back tomorrow with more fun. See ya.